that skill, being able to interview at five companies at the same time and being good at software engineering are completely different. What was the, the biggest challenge for you to, to get into that sector? A lot of people think it's not a skill. They think it's something that, you, that like you're just born with or something like that. And it's like, no, it's, you have to practice. What do you think we should learn as data engineer today to be ahead of the game in five years? Ooh, Zach, right. hello, it's a, welcome. It's a pleasure to, uh, <laughs> to have you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm happy you're in SF. <laughs> yeah, was uh, was a long trip. Always. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it's like it's the other side of the like world, six, right? Yeah, it's like 16 <laughs> hours in total. I think uh, uh, plus uh, jet lag. So I'll do a, a quick intro of you. Yep. And you will have some time to correct if there is anything wrong with that. Yep. So Zach emerged as a prominent young voice in data engineering during 2021 and 2022. Uh, his active engagement began in 2021, I believe, initially on LinkedIn before mm -hmm. dipping some toes into YouTube and Medium. Uh, and today we've over 250K followers on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, 15, 15K subscribers on YouTube and a recent surge uh, uh, to almost 30K on TikTok mm -hmm. uh, and launching his Substack uh, newsletter, Zach continues to inspire countless individuals in the data sector, uh, myself included. So thank you for that, Zach. Um, and Zach is doing his content by night, but by day he crossed the ocean of the Fang world, work as a data engineer slash software engineer, ex-Facebook, ex-Netflix, X Airbnb yeah, <laughs> and now X employee uh, embarking on an entrepreneurial journey as a solo content creator in the tech industry. Yep. As does this intro sound to you? Will yep. you fill sounds, some gap in? That sounds pretty accurate. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, you, you nailed it. You nailed it pretty well there. Yeah, like I, um, uh, I, uh, yeah, this journey has been so nuts. Like, and just like being able to just like build this up build this up you know and keep creating keep creating yeah but you nailed it you nailed the intro so let, let's let's talk about you getting into the the fang word so mm -hmm. going back uh yeah. before getting into facebook i i guess mm -hmm. what what was the the biggest challenge for you to to get into that sector um i think a couple things like one is staying really uh, over indexes on hiring for um, from like Ivy Leagues or like I mean you know like at uh, Facebook like you either need to be at Stanford or Berkeley those are like if you're if you don't go to those schools it's a lot harder to get in at Facebook yeah and so I think that that was one of the things because I went to a no-name college and so I think that was probably like trying to figure out how to build a kind of a reputation and convince them that I was worth hiring yeah. was definitely one of the things that I think was like my biggest hurdle. Uh, and the way I kind of pulled that off though was through building a nice portfolio of projects that I worked on and uh, just was able to, and then also obviously uh, getting good at like data structures and algorithms and all those other kind of pieces of the interview as well, you know? What would you recommend to someone, you know, trying to set up the feet into that word? Mm -hmm. Um, they have sometimes what's what's like the biggest advice you would give them um okay there's a couple like one is going to be like what role do you want to get into do you want to get into like the data engineering role or the software engineering role or the data analyst role like re first focus make sure you know which role you want to get because then that matters a lot on like what you need to focus on and then like well so since we're both data engineers we'll talk about data engineering for the data engineer role, like make sure you got to know SQL. You're going to be asked a lot about SQL, a lot. Like, I mean, I think in the interview at Facebook, I was asked SQL for like almost three hours. Like it was like two and a half hours of SQL questions, right? It was an aggressive amount of SQL, right? Um, and so that's a big one. Make sure to have like some sort of portfolio project, some sort of side project that you've been yeah. working on, right? Unless you've like worked, unless you went to like MIT or Stanford or something <laughs> like that, then that works too, right? But like, that's not, you know, that's not most people, right? But like, I'd say those are the big things is like that. And then uh, also another one is like, I think it's a lot easier to get in at those companies. Like if you already are in the Bay Area, like, cause I know mm -hmm. that like when they do the filtering of people, 
like they will look at the resume and be like, oh, this person's like somewhere far away, right? So like they give them less of a shot. Even like so, yeah. it's like someone who's like less qualified in the Bay Area is probably more likely to get an interview than someone who's more qualified like somewhere else in the world. Yeah. Right. And um, even though you know Facebook is a company that does do a lot of like visa sponsorships and they do do a lot of that. But they, they, they also still still want to hire a lot of people like in the States as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. I have a friend, a Belgian friend, mm. uh, that moved to the Bay Area without uh, basically the job mm. and uh, taking two months mm -hmm. to, you know, pass all the interview. And he, he ended up with two offers, one at Facebook and one at Tesla. Mm -hmm. And I think it's exactly what you mentioned. It's like, it's easy or now you know to get into that door mm -hmm. but also like managing on-site interview uh, i mean now it's a bit different with the post uh mm -hmm. COVID words in in the remote era what what yeah. was the what, do you have any insight that airbnb like all the interview were still conducted remotely yeah they were all like i mean uh i did my whole interview with airbnb in 2021 yeah i was like, in the was... full lockdown but do you, yeah. do you know if there is any like other thing in the bay area starting to do like do in we... person uh yeah on -site I, interview? I, if i had a guess i would i'd guess that like the first company to do that would be like tesla right because yeah. <laughs> elon's all about that you know return to office right like you, you gotta be there you gotta show up 40 yeah. hours a week or whatever right like i i i, I still think though like i guess i put some feelers out there just to see like what kind of offers i could get right now but like uh, and the the interviews so far that i've come across they've the, the on-sites are still pretty much remote right they yeah they recognize i i I've always wondered because, like, I think that some people have this kind of uh, doubt about it because they think, like, oh, remote interviews, like, you're more likely to be able to, like, use chat GPT behind the scenes or something like that, right? Because, like, if you're in person, you know, you, <laughs> it's, it's a higher fidelity signal, right, yeah. For, than it is, like, if uh, you're remote because someone might be using a laptop behind you, like, uh, giving you all the answers, right? So it's a little bit nuanced because post-COVID things change. So you need to be around in the US, mm -hmm. not necessarily for the interview, but just like it's it's easier for the company to hire you. There is no visa question or mm. extra relocation package. I exactly, guess. exactly. And I mean, well, and then they also are thinking like, oh, well, if this person needs to come to the office, like it won't be as much of a lift, right? It's like they don't have to catch an international flight if they need to come to the office, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and no jet lag. Yeah, no I mean, jet I can lag, tell yeah. that's... Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's, I don't know. Sometimes when I go to New York, I get jet lag. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to take, talk a bit about uh, salaries. Mm -hmm. And one fun fact is that my first blog post that blew up on LinkedIn... Mm. was a reaction on your post nice uh, when you shared your uh it was netflix uh, yeah. salaries mm -hmm. um which was 500k mm -hmm. total com yeah um and i wanted to give a bit of a uh, you know a different point of view into that post uh eu versus us salary because mm -hmm. when you do the math it's 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 really complicated mm -hmm. you know healthcare Oh, yeah. included even if it's a higher mm -hmm. uh, netto in your pocket well and and then also healthcare but also then it's like if you're like oh i want to buy a house in sf it's like okay the house is going to be like three million dollars and it's like <laughs> okay okay like what the hell right yeah, yeah. so <laughs> yeah. Um, housing so, yeah. costs are crazy here right <laughs> exactly but so um coming to back to that salary transparency mm -hmm. um what do you think is missing today uh regarding salary benchmark or salary transparency for mm -hmm. uh, for employees um i think there's been a lot of really good things that have happened it, it, even in the last years since i made that post like you know there's these new laws in california and colorado that force force employers to like post a range but then like the thing is is like then those employers they just post really stupid ranges yeah, right like I saw, that. I saw a netflix job posting that said oh we pay between 150k and 900k and yeah. it's like it's like netflix like that's that's like like that's like the same as saying we pay between one dollar and a million dollars yeah you right? just have to roll the dice <laughs> yeah know? yeah you know you well, i feel bad for the guy who's getting paid 150 when his <laughs> colleagues getting paid 900 all right i feel bad <laughs> yeah, yeah. but like i think that like what a part of it is that is around like what realistically needs to happen there. I also think that there's like another thing that like is tricky is around like negotiations. Cause a lot of times like 
some people don't negotiate nearly as often as other people and like they end up like getting paid substantially less like because a lot of times in those negotiation processes you can get 20 30 percent more money and like and then if you just don't do that then yeah like you you're gonna get paid less throughout your entire career do you think there is a risk of negotiation at the end of a process oh that's a, I, I think that that's one of the reasons why some people don't do it is because they think that like oh if i don't if i if i negotiate then they're gonna take the offer back or whatever right and Generally speaking, no. I think that, like, uh, in my experience when I've negotiated, I've always, I've never had like an offer been like, oh, oh, you want, you want more money? Okay, well then, well, never mind, right? Like, we, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. we, <laughs> like, usually it's like, because it's a two-way thing, right? Because they want to be able to, uh, they, they want you to be excited about taking the job as well, because like they know that that emotional energy of like, I, I really like this company, and I, and this is enough for me is going to show up in your productivity as well, right? Yeah. It's going to like, and so like they want to negotiate with you, especially like, I mean, I found negotiations to get, go kind of a couple ways, right? Where like, if you don't have any like competing offers from other companies, a lot of times negotiations don't go anywhere. They just yeah. like essentially are flat. But if you do, if you do have competing offers from other companies, that's when negotiations really, really can like move your compensation up quite a bit. Yeah. But that's where like, that's where I think it's kind of unfair in the comp in the, in that world though, because it's like uh, a lot of people like they find job interviews to be stressful, and so it's like okay, if you want to get the most money, you have to go and interview of five companies at the same time, right? And that's yeah. like, and even if you're and, and and one of the things that I find crazy about it is that like that skill, being able to interview at five companies at the same time, and being good at software engineering are completely different like yeah. and 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 so yeah. like like just because and so it's like oh i'm good at interviewing therefore i get paid more than you even though you're a better engineer than me right yeah. <laughs> and that is a part of like the whole compensation negotiation discussion that we aren't you know we aren't ready to have yet because like the whole process is kind of broken in that way i hope in the future one of the things that we can do is we can get a more objective measure of like skills yeah. right and like I, right now that's kind of we use like leak code yeah, problems yeah, yeah. for that and i hate that too but like i think having a more objective measures of skills versus like and then paying people based on that versus paying people based on how many interviews they can get at the same time yeah it would be better because it's like i mean obviously uh you know jobs are a marketplace and you have marketplace and economics and all yeah. that stuff but it's yeah, it's complicated uh, for sure. Yeah, but th this is one advice. I, one of my last uh, long-form blog posts was about that uh, because I, this past two years, every time I change job, I take a break mm -hmm. and I interview as many companies as I can in parallel. Mm -hmm. And I think it's always a risk because I'm leaving a company without anything. Yeah. Um, but it's a risk I can't tolerate, you know, mm -hmm. based on, on my finance. I mean, I do some plan, even if you take one week, but I yeah. take usually a month. Mm -hmm. And then it's worth it because yeah. the money I get yeah. compared to doing just one interview while working and I'm stressed, you know. Oh, it's work. way, way more stressful when you're working full time. I remember like, uh, like in 2021, like I was you know, like, cause like when I, when I joined Airbnb, right, I joined Airbnb uh, when the stock was at the absolute highest point yeah. and it's never come back. It's never come back. <laughs> like, I mean, even now it's never come back, right? It's, it still has not gotten back yeah, to where it was when I got hired. And like, so I was kind of like in 2021, I was like, wow, well, that was a loss right there. And so I was like, I went and interviewed and I was interviewing at like, uh, I was interviewing at a couple companies at once. It was like Clubhouse and Robinhood and Snapchat. And they both. And yeah. I was interviewing and working full time. And like, I remember that like, I had like two weeks there and like, uh, I remember I was in a, Robin Hood was the last interview and I remember I was like just so stressed out that like yeah. I ended up bombing it. I ended up bombing the interview because my emotional energy was yeah. just not there. You need to and, sleep. Yeah. To and that's rest. where like that's where the um, I, I do like that strategy of like where, right, where it's like just quit working your job. If you're yeah. unsatisfied with your job, quit working your job and then take a break. Yeah. Take like a couple weeks off and then go into like the interview process again yeah. where like you can focus all of your energy on exactly. that, right? But it's, and, a, it's all yeah. about the risk you can tolerate, even mm -hmm. if you have a mortgage or whatsoever, look yeah. at your finance. Yeah, But sure. the, what you're gonna get from will be much more. Oh yeah, But uh, to, to coming back to the initial question, 
there is there is obviously no risk for someone to just send an email and try to negotiate yeah. at the end of a process. Yeah, because yeah. Because yeah. the company spends so much money into the process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They won't just do okay. No, we we want to hire this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know <laughs> exactly. Where it's like you might as well. Like there's no downside risk of yeah. that. Like even though like. I think that most people, I would say a majority of people think there is. They, they think there is a downside yeah. risk of like, well, I will lose this opportunity if I try to negotiate. And there's like, no, nah, no, like that's not going to happen. Like I, 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 I mean, and if it does, you don't want to work there. Like you really don't want to work there. If <laughs> yeah. like they aren't like, like if they aren't willing to like at least, like even if they say they can't budge, but if they like rescind the offer, yeah, like you don't want to work there anyways, because that's yeah. like a crazy company that like obviously won't listen to you, you know. And what what, what <laughs> would be the pragmatic tips you you give to someone that need to send uh, a negotiation yeah. email? Yeah, um, I think there's a couple things there. Like one is like, well, if you have multiple offers, then like it's obvious. Like you can be like, hey, well, this is my offer for my other company. Yeah. Right. That's a like the. That's why interviewing in multiple companies is great. But even if you don't, I've seen success from people who negotiate and they, they only have one offer, right? <laughs> and um, a part of it is uh, they, you can look at more like market rates, right? And you'd be like, hey, well, I like, especially like if the offer comes in pretty low, then you can be like, well, I look at the market rate data and like, this is not enough money, right? And like, and uh, that's work, that's work for some people as well. Just like yeah. being like, hey, Glassdoor says this is like off by like 15, 20K. Like, can we, can we get, you know, can we get closer? Right? I mean, I, that, that negotiation tactic isn't going to work in big tech because big tech just pays so well that like that that's not going to work. Right. Because it's like, if you look at Glassdoor, you'll be like, oh, wow, I'm, this offer is already way higher than average, yeah. right? Yeah, I feel sometimes the, the yeah. numbers over there on Glassdoor are not. Yeah, not they're not very accurate, accurate anyways, yeah. right? Yeah, that's where levels, levels.fyi, yeah. for, especially for big tech, that's where to go for like the, um, okay. like the kind of the getting closer to like what the actual like market data is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically looking at the market data, even if you have only one offer. Mm -hmm. And what I usually do, I can add is uh, highlighting why. I mean, mm -hmm. so. Here it's the market data, but it could be also something else based on your skill set or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, relocation even yeah. within the U.S., you know, mm -hmm. yeah. highlighting some pain points of concern and not just say, hey, can we get a higher salary? Yeah, right? yeah. And like, and a lot of times, like, they might not be able to budge on salary, but they might be able to budge on other things. Like, they might be able to give you more equity. They might be able to give you more, um, like, a sign-on bonus, bonus, right? Yeah. Or, or even they might be able to give you an extra week of vacation days, yeah. right? There's like this, there's, there's like there's interesting ways that companies can kind of like uh, like work with stuff. Work because salary a lot of the times is like the hardest one for them to move on. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah definitely. Because I know for me, like I was when I was negotiating with Airbnb, I was able to get more equity, right? But they weren't able to move the salary. Okay. Right. And so that's like when and and that oh, that was like. And I mean, that's especially the big tech companies. That is very common. Yeah. Very common where they're like, we'll, they're, they're, we'll give you more stock. All right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Cool. And the way I did that, that I negotiated that was I was like, the stock, I, I, I even told them like, the stock price is very high right now, right? <laughs> the stock price is very, very high. It just went up like 200%. Like, y'all need to give me more stocks because the risk, <laughs> because there's just risk in the stock going down, right? Yeah. And, and I felt very good about that. I felt very good about like negotiating in that way as well because I was like, yo, like, this is like how it is, right? Yeah. And, then, and then I was right. I was right about all of that. The stock went down and then I'm like, and I'm, I'm very glad that I did do, did do that negotiation, you know? That's a, that's a really good point to mention that Understanding the macroeconomic situation to balance your equity and cash, mm -hmm. depending on the risk you can tolerate. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's like one thing I did like when I, when getting a new job during this downturn is like, yeah, I prefer to you know value more cash this yeah, point of time definitely. because a lot of things can get worse. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> so so that's also a very good point. So what's the biggest weakness do you think? Uh, there is for a classic fang software engineer compared to mm -hmm. the outside world because oh, the good. outside world normal companies uh, often like you know look at glorious tech company and mm. people working like, from there all, they're like oh they're all rock stars they're exactly. all like if they hire a fang engineer all their problems will be solved that's right? why it's we like, we have those x yeah. facebook <laughs> x oh yeah, yeah oh yeah, yeah. And, we're, and we're all here and that's why <laughs> that's why i'm famous right yeah. but so <laughs> let's let's look at the at oh, the yeah. other side the, the, the dark side yeah. right oh so yeah let's see I like mean, what, what what would be the i mean the biggest issue of a classic fang engineer I, I think the big one is that like fang engineers especially like if that's the only place they've worked is 
uh, they don't have the scrappiness that you need to work at other companies. Like, because it's like, for example, like especially data engineers. Like, for, so for data engineering, like at Facebook, right? They have a they have a team called the data platform team, right? Which is like 200 people. And what they work on is managing all of the Spark and the compute and the clusters and like all of like the infrastructure. And then all you have to do as a data engineer at Facebook is write SQL, right? And that's yeah. pretty much it. That's pretty much it, right? And like, and the thing is, is like you have to be good at it. You have to be good at like analytics and analytical patterns and all that kind of stuff. But like, if you go to another company, like you're going to have more responsibilities, right? Where it's like, as a data engineer, a lot of times at other companies, like you're going to need to know how to manage stuff. Like you're going to need to know Kubernetes and Docker and a lot more of like that kind of like DevOps kind of yeah. uh, vibe, right? And like, um, and that like, uh, and those things like, they aren't there as much for like Fang, Fang engineers just because like they like, they really want Fang engineers to focus on like more narrowly on their specialty yeah. as opposed to more broadly on like getting everything done. And yeah. so I'd say that that's probably, if I had to like paint all Fang engineers with a broad brush, I'd say that's going to be the side that's going to be trickier for them. Right? Yeah, it's funny because this is the, the reason why I didn't get into Fang. Mm -hmm. I was in process with Facebook mm -hmm. uh, and then I, 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 I joined um, a scale up Klarna, so mm -hmm. with FinTech where I felt like I'm more like a generalist, general, generalist uh, mm -hmm. data engineer where yeah. I know a lot of different things, but sometimes I, I like some, you know, some deep thing. So yeah, that's, I, that, that's, that's where like, I, w I wouldn't be like a good Fang engineer uh, for the, for those reasons. Yeah, you get uh, bored, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I also, I think um, that's, a, that's a really good point. And the, the other thing I, w I would add is uh, everything is custom. Mm -hmm. Everything is custom built, right? And so yeah, you I learned mean, a lot from how to build things from scratch. So that's a pro, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and framework yeah. or, you know, Definitely. design software. But the, but the problem with that is you're not aware of like what you can leverage off the shelf. Well, yeah, the, the build, kind of the build versus buy phenomenon. Exactly, right? yeah. Well, and that's, well, and that's more true at Facebook than it is at Netflix and Airbnb, okay. right? I mean, at Netflix and Airbnb, they still use a lot of like the, because Netflix and Airbnb are both completely on AWS, yeah. right? And so they do use a lot of like the Amazon services, right? The kind of the things that you can take off the shelf, yeah. right? And so like that was, why I left Facebook was that it was exactly that where I was like, wow, I'm learning all of these awesome custom services that aren't used anywhere else in the entire <laughs> world. Oh, all of this applicable knowledge. Thank you, Facebook. Right. And it's like, and that was like, that was definitely one of the motivating reasons for me where I was like, I wanted to work at a company that was in an actual cloud environment that I would yeah. use outside. Not like, and I've always, that's always one of the things I thought was so crazy is that Facebook is like, they have their own cloud. Like, yeah. And it's just weird to me that like Facebook doesn't like compete. Like like it's weird because they totally could. They could totally like go and take on GCP, AWS, and Azure. They can make their own cloud offering. And it's like because they have like data centers all throughout the world, right? They have like all sorts of like stuff like that as well, where they could totally like if they wanted to, they could totally like open and make their own cloud offering. It's just I find it interesting that they don't because especially because like you know, cloud offerings like that are so like profitable, right? Yeah. And it's like, and it's like, it's just interesting to me that like they, they're like, no, we have all this infrastructure, but we're going to just use it for Facebook, right? <laughs> but let's see, maybe if the bet on the metaverse isn't oh. working out. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, they might, they might pivot, dude. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, for they, sure. They might pivot. <laughs> no, it is, that's really interesting. And we have a grain of salt, of course. Uh, I think the valuable thing you mentioned earlier, mm. if you only work at a thing, uh, mm. right? And I think like that's that's a big difference with people, you know, having different kind of experience. They have mm. different view, but at least you you can see how how things can be built from scratch, mm. and you can more easily evaluate, you know, product of the shelf to say, mm. you know, like okay, this is not really good because this, it, they they haven't thought about this as you know input mm. output or API services exactly because you've built it yourself. From yeah, you own. know you know the underlying right. You know the layers below yeah. right, and it's like because if you know the layers below and you're not just dealing with the abstraction, that's definitely like a very powerful thing, right? Yeah. It can be a very very powerful way to like. That's one of the things that I, I I'm trying to like instill more in data engineers because I feel that like a lot of them like they just like 
they kind of like use libraries and they're just like, oh, it works. And it's, they kind of think of it as like, it kind of works kind of like automatically, right? Yeah. And it's like, uh, like, nah, you should be thinking a little bit more about like, what is that actually doing underneath the hood? Like how is Spark actually working? Yeah. Like what is going on underneath the hood? So that like, if things do go wrong, then because it's like, if you think about it, like as if it's just like automagical, then th when things go wrong, it's like, I don't know what's going on. It's like the magic quit working, right? <laughs> and about that, how do you see data engineering evolving? Because mm -hmm. I agree with what you just said, but at the, at the, some, at the same point, uh, at the same side, I, I need to disagree because I feel like my work has been more and more high level mm -hmm. and more productive. Yeah, so definitely. So to stay pragmatic, let's say you're new... Um, for getting into the data engineering world, mm -hmm. what would you recommend and to to learn? What things you you would say to prioritize learning? Because there is so oh, yeah. much things, right? Yeah. Well, like I've talked about this quite a bit, like uh, in on, in my content and stuff like that. Is that like I think that data engineering is kind of going to be split, and that's why like I totally like your disagreeing here makes a lot of sense as well. Is that like there's kind of I think if it's going to split into kind of two ways on one side, you, you have it split more in like, in like the analytics kind of realm of like, okay, how can we solve and answer business problems more quickly? Yeah. Right. And that's like exactly to your point of like saying, oh yeah, things are getting more high level and I'm more productive and more efficient. Right. And it's like, that's totally right on one side. And I think that that's totally going to be the one way that data engineering is going to split. Right. It is going to become more closer to the business uh more closer to like the analytics and the kpis of like the the space right where like you can essentially i think of it as like analysts becoming engineers almost like or, or the other way around engineers becoming analysts too like you kind of go both directions there that's like where you have like the analytics engineer kind yeah. of archetype i think that that that's gonna blow up i've in my two years at airbnb i watched them like they had no analytics engineers and then when i left they had like a lot of them right and i was like <laughs> okay like i can see how that's going to be one way. I also think that the other way is that like you have you have it on like the producer side, like the data producer side of like okay, and a lot of times those the the producer side is a lot of like software engineers who like make online systems and do a lot of logging and uh and I think that they're going to get better at producing data and that will uh and to a point where like a lot of ETL won't even need to exist anymore because like it's just logged and generated correctly like yeah. the first time. And so like, and, and that archetype is different though, right? That's like the, I, I call that like the SWE DE archetype. Yeah. I, I, I try to, that's, that's, that's what I try to, like I feel like in my core, in my soul, that's who I am as a person is like a SWE DE. And so, uh, and I think that is, that's kind of the split is gonna be those two. And then I think that the more traditional data engineer who like focuses on ETL, is will get lesser actually, yeah. and they'll be like you either need to start focusing more on analytics or more focusing on like the producing the producing side. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. I think uh, Google, right? They mm -hmm. have they call the data software engineer. They, I think, I'm not sure what's the status now, but I know for uh, for a while they didn't have like a data engineer role yeah. position. Yeah, like at Netflix, uh, my role was software engineer comma data. Uh, that's, what it, that's what it was at Netflix when I was like working there where I had like my online systems and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you're pretty open about mental health mm -hmm. and what are the bad habits software engineer take around oh. this, especially yeah. like in the, in, the, I mean, in the tech industry? I think there's a couple of big ones. Like one is like not taking enough breaks, right? They just like, they think that like, oh, I must solve this coding problem right now so i'm going to sit in front of the computer for, for four hours and like i'm not getting up until this problem is solved right i think that is very common actually and like it's terrible for you absolutely terrible for you like you should only be like focusing on problems at the very longest for like 30 minutes right yeah. 30 minutes at a time and then you should be taking like a five or ten minute break and walking around you know the whole pompadour technique i don't think like enough software engineers are doing that another one is around like not being outside enough, right? Like you need to be outside and actually like in, interact with like the world. Humans are meant to be outside, just like, you know, do, do, <laughs> dogs though that, that's why I like dogs, right? Cause dogs like, they, they, Lulu really motivates me to get outside more. Cause like she loves being outside. That's her favorite place. And, uh, and I think that's a big one, like for sure. And like, obviously I think there's another side around like overuse of other things, like use, drinking too much coffee and uh, using too much caffeine as like a, 
a kind of a way to like turn because I, I know that there's like kind of this meme that says like hi i'm a software engineer i turn coffee into software yeah right, 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 right. <laughs> right. yeah no that's all right and uh, one last thing i would add is holidays and uh. This is something I really value in Europe, is the mm. number of holidays we have. Oh, yeah. And I, I talk with many people from the Bay Area moving to Europe for one single reason. Yeah. I want more holidays. Yeah. And they told me, like all of them, that usually we don't take like long break, like three, two or three weeks is yeah. quite common in Europe. Yeah, take, yeah. You know, one time during the year. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's super important because it's a huge reset of your mind and you see things and problems differently a mm -hmm. bit at a different scale than yeah. your struggle with a you know uh, a software issue yeah and you hitting your head around the keyboard rather than taking a small break yeah it's a small a same thing at a different scale if you take a three weeks break yeah and you're coming back and you see but yeah but actually building this is not making any sense yeah exactly <laughs> and you'll be able to see things in a way new fresh perspective you know yeah yeah definitely yeah mental I'm, health is so important <laughs> have you have you tried to prioritize like such such a break oh yeah for sure i mean <laughs> that was i i made that mistake after quitting airbnb a lot of my friends were like zach you need to take a break before you like jump into things i'm like i definitely made that mistake i'm definitely uh gonna be i'm doing that now like right after this week i'm gonna be taking like a week off or two weeks off to just kind of like try to reset before i start the start the boot camp right so yeah. i can like uh like be, look at the look at everything from a more fresh perspective and not have like not just be so like compressed right yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and holidays do you Mm -hmm. Do you log off from LinkedIn? Oh. Do you log off from social I, media? I need to do better, or I need to do better. I've actually been, uh, like, mostly no, mostly no. The only, so, like, last year, uh, there was only one week. So I took, I, I, I missed, so I post almost every day on LinkedIn. Last year, I posted 355, I think 355 days. I think I missed, like, like seven to ten days, right? And seven of them were all in a row, which was uh, when I was at Burning Man. But that was because I had no access to my phone. Because <laughs> that's the only that's reason. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was good. It was very good for me. Very good for my soul. I know I need to do more of that. More of those like kind of like uh, digital detoxes, right? For yeah. sure. For sure. Like. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and there is tools like to help you also to measure that, right? Mm -hmm. I. I think like for me, once my audience grow, it's not still not the same. Um, size and yours but at some point i was getting too much linkedin notification so i was just disabling it oh yeah keep a time yeah no then like measure measure like there is i think the software is stay free mm -hmm. which measure how many times you go on the web app and on the mobile app so yeah. you can see on the day yeah and when you saw this uh, does this number like you say okay i i need to calm down yeah you're like i can't do this yeah for <laughs> sure for sure it's too much <laughs> but that that's the bad side of things uh the good side, how, how content has changed your, your career? I mean, it's been amazing. It's given me like this audience and like these people who like trust me to like help teach them and grow them. And like, and that's something that I'm really happy about because I think it's giving me this new kind of path forward. Because yeah. for a long time, I mean, I, my, I was laser focused on like, I'm going to be a principal engineer in big tech. That was yeah. like my dream, right? And I was like, and I wanted to do it. I was like, my, my, my dream was like, I want to be a principal engineer in big tech before I'm 30. That was my dream, right? And, uh, and it's just fine. I find it interesting that like, like now I like, I'm like, nah, not important. Not, not, and it's like, it was less important than I thought it was going to be. And like, uh, and especially cause like this, uh, content is just giving me a path forward that feels more compelling and yeah. more like, uh, healthy. Right. Whereas like, cause I, like, and as opposed to just grind, 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 grind. Cause like, doesn't I mean working in big tech. I mean, I've been doing it. I worked in big tech for seven years. Right. And it's freaking like it's a lot dude it's a grind like it's like it's like uh especially like as you get higher up once you get past senior once you're yeah. in like a staff or higher up engineers dude it's like it's a lot of responsibility and a lot of just like uh planning and risk management and stuff like that and like like i don't know i i, I definitely i couldn't see myself being a principal engineer in big tech for like 20 years right yeah. doing it for like a long time right i mean like whereas like being a content creator and being a teacher and stuff yeah. like that i could see myself doing it very long term yeah. And that's one of the things that like, I find very beautiful about content is that like it's something that feels more like true to me and less stressful. And it feels like, oh, wow, this is something that like I can I can I, I don't have to think about it because like in big tech, I was always working. I'm like just two more years and then I'm done two more yeah. years and I'm financially free fire. Ah, right? <laughs> All that stuff. Right. And it's like um, 
but like i don't know i i realize now i was just thinking in this like very kind of like short-term mindset right of like and not really thinking about like okay but what could i be doing like um long term right like can i can i actually make something where i can be like happy doing something for 20 years yeah. right and, be, and as opposed to like being like okay i only have a couple more years then i can retire right <laughs> but but writing so con writing was not coming uh it was not an overnight success right yeah no it, so can you a bit elaborate on that because people see the hyper growth it's tr yeah. it's true that it's a huge success from you know the time period mm -hmm. uh you've been growing your audience yeah but when did you start actually writing? i mean like december 2020 was when i was like really kind of got into it and um uh and yeah i mean it was it was a grind especially those first six months like from december to like as it took me from december 2020 to june 2021 that's how like it took me like seven months to get to 10k right and i was like wow <laughs> this is like and like and uh, but when i it's did a lot of sacrifice yeah. and commitment and for, and, and, and yeah. we're like it was like kind of slow and kind of but like i i also like was just having fun with it right and i was yeah. like and that was the whole i mean at, at that then i was just like i was just just like trying to have fun and like being like oh this writing stuff seems interesting but then it was like the next six months were really crazy because then like from june 2021 to december 2021 i went from 10k to 110k right in six months yeah. and that was like i'm like whoa dude like this is a lot this is like this it's is like compounded it, yeah it was like it was a 10x sort of thing yeah. that happened right and i uh was and I, that, that was when it became like more obvious to me that this was gonna like be my life and that like i knew i was gonna do this kind of more long term and then then like uh i i really found a good rhythm for things and start i like, kept building and growing and doing stuff you know and uh but like, yeah, it, it, it takes time and practice and like, you're gonna, uh, your, your first hundred posts are gonna suck. I mean, it's just like YouTube, right? Where it's yeah. like, you know, your first, you know, 50 videos or, you know, 30 videos or whatever, they're gonna, they're not gonna be that good, right? But like, that's fine. Like, it's like, it's all about like learning the process. It's kind of like trying to be like, oh, I'm gonna go ski down a mountain and I'm gonna do the most difficult mountain first and I've never <laughs> skied before. And like, that's not gonna work, right? You yeah. gotta, you gotta start on the easier ones and like, be like, okay, kind of, learn and get a little bit better get a little bit better and then like you can eventually do amazing amazing content production right but you have to it's a skill it's a skill it's not like a lot of people think it's not a skill they think it's something that you that like you're just born with or something like that and it's like no it's you have to practice lot, lots of practice right <laughs> and would you would you recommend content for a standard software engineer they're like not mm -hmm. at the level mm -hmm. because here it's like really you know a new path for you yeah so that's different and yeah. Not everybody needs, and there is a lot of content creator that, you know, have a big audience, but they, they don't do that full time. Yeah, I mean, uh, and so what, what would be like the biggest pro for them in their tech career? I mean, content? I think that if you make content like that is just a whole other way. It's, it's, it's similar to like having a lot of stars on GitHub, right? If you like make a lot of open source contributions, that's another way to build your brand or you can make a, you can make content on LinkedIn and maybe don't be as obsessive about it as me like you know I you know I show up every day maybe show up like once a week right and like make content and like have it be a very small commitment for you and like a way to like sl slowly build your brand up and then like then it's like that will be just another great way to get more visibility and have more opportunities come your way because that's like I know for me like given like my LinkedIn even even if I didn't have the pedigree I had of like uh, like the big tech pedigree, like if I just had the followers that I have right now, I know that I could get an interview at pretty much any company with like what I have now. Yeah. And it's just like because like they're like, wow, this guy like is like is very visible, right? Yeah. And so it's it, it can it really opens up a lot of doors. Did, right? did you remember some some example where it helps you in your really software engineer or data engineer job? Yeah, I mean, like when not getting the job or oh yeah, the, oh yeah, the that's a great one. So, oh, in the job. so uh, in the job, yeah, for sure. Like, so when I worked at Airbnb, I like, uh, I told my man, I, I hate, I hate being the interviewer. I hate interviewing, right? I mean, I'm, I love being on the other side and like doing it. Like, it's stressful, but like, I like it because I'm like, well, I might get a job from it. But like, when you're the interviewer, there's an 80, 80 percent chance that you have to reject that person right because like most people yeah. don't get in at big tech right so most of the time it's like a kind of a sad experience right and so like uh, i even told my manager i was like i don't want to do interviews right i don't want to do interviews like even though like when you're a tech lead and a staff yeah, that's a bit yeah <laughs> you're you're, so, you're you're supposed to do interviews you're supposed to like at airbnb the expectation is you're supposed to do four a week right and uh and i was like i don't want to do them i don't want to do them at all and then like and then my manager she was like well 
you have to contribute somehow, right? And then I was like, okay, I will just get you guys leads. So what I would do is like I would post um, like a, 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 an Airbnb role like once a week, right? And just like uh, I would, and then hundreds of people would apply to that role, <laughs> right? And then that's how, and then and then like and then I could follow those people through the journey and see who got hired. And so like so for me, I was like, yeah, I'm not doing interviews, but I'm getting you guys hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more like high quality applicants. Yeah. And that's where LinkedIn was very useful. It made it so I got like four or five hours a week back of my time at Airbnb yeah. where I didn't have to do interviews, right? And I could just do I could just do lead generation instead. Yeah, right? I, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. I, I had the same time thing happening, uh, but it was actually uh, with Ben. So the Seattle data guy was mentioning mm. me in a blog post that had a lot of traction mm. and there was my company and we had the data engineer position. Yeah. And then I saw like a bump because we didn't like finding data engineer applying to non yeah. like tech company but not like big fang yeah it's a struggle and then there was like a small peak during the week and i was like hmm, what's happening yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I look back you know yeah you and it was it. Like, it was due to to social media and content so mm -hmm. that's true that's a it's a really neat way to yeah around your way of, of of things too another thing i, w I would say within the job is uh, because that was a really creative way for you to escape mm. interviews. But aside from that, I'm, like as a lead, you write a lot, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, for RFP and so on and mm. design. Yeah. And definitely. just uh, having the habit of writing and make it clear and understandable. Persuasion, for people, right? right? Yeah, for sure. That's like get people to big, buy into your yeah, vision. Yeah, that's like a big skills. Mm -hmm. And if you like can measure that with an external audience, which is also you know tech mm -hmm. and a different kind of people, mm -hmm. then it's easier to do um, within so, within your job. What do you think we should uh, learn as data engineer today? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, to sure. be ahead of the game in mm -hmm. five years. Ooh, so to give you an example, when Adobe was starting mm -hmm. and, you know, I think back then I started to learn uh, distributed compute and mm -hmm. I, I was able to do, you know, a few lines of Spark. Mm -hmm. And back then I looked like an alien. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then everybody was jumping on the Spark mm -hmm. bandwagon and yeah. had a huge advantage because of that. Oh yeah, for What's, sure. So that's the example. What, what would be the next thing? Ooh. I think, I think there's a couple here that like I, I that are like, that are on the horizon that I see. I think one is around um, learning about Rust as a programming language, just understanding it and like how it works. Cause it's gonna be, I think it's gonna kind of replace the JVM. Uh, I, Cause the JVM has been the kind of the <laughs> winner. It's yeah. been like, cause like with Hadoop, Hadoop and Spark and all those, it's just like, cause all of that's just Java MapReduce in, it's just like, Java MapReduce, but a more efficient way of doing it, right? That's like how, and that's what Spark essentially is. And that like, I really think that the, the future is gonna, because I think most data engineers recognize that like the JVM is probably not like, like the most efficient way that we could be doing like these kind of big data jobs, right? And that like, there's gonna be like, you can go one layer lower and like have like one fewer layers of abstraction and go with Rust and it's cause, cause Rust goes like right to the metal, right? And that's like a lot, uh, could be a lot faster, I mean, I think it's like two or three X faster than Java, right? And so uh, I think that Rust is gonna be, but like, I'm not saying that you need to really learn Rust end to end because I, I really think it's gonna be similar to like kind of like PySpark yeah. situation where like you have Python that calls Rust uh, libraries and then Rust runs. Yeah. But like understanding how Rust executes, similar to like understanding how Java executes, yeah. where you have like Java, J JVM, Java bytecode, and how they, and how all like that kind of stacking happens, like understanding that with Rust is is good. I'm not saying that you have to like become an expert Rust like um, yeah. wizard, right? Because like, unless that's what you want to do. Because I mean, I think that, but that's not data engineering. I think that that's software engineering. Uh, but like, I think that's one thing. Uh, I think another side that is like kind of a, a different vein of things is really understanding like kind of just how to do real-time data, right? And like, I think Flink is getting there, like Flink and like Kafka and all this stuff. I think people are starting to recognize that like we can do more real-time, that like it's not out, it's not as far out of reach, especially, especially you know, uh, Confluent, if you yeah. use Confluent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Confluent's really awesome. Confluent really lowers like the barrier to entry. And there is a lot that. of other startups yeah. uh, doing that now to try to even 
oh, yeah. at a higher level of abstraction. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like um, there's this, uh, do you know Chip? Chip Hewen? Yeah. yeah, like uh, her startup, uh, Claypot. Claypot is all about that of like how, because like, some machine learning models, right? They take uh, batch features, but yeah. they also take real time features. And that process of like marrying the batch features with the real time features is like a complicated one. It's a messy, complicated problem. And, uh, and that's what Claypot's all about is like how to like, how can we build um, infrastructure that allows for this to be like a, a more straightforward problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's, I think that's another area where uh, data engineers can like be ahead of the game is understanding like that layer as well, of, like that kind of feature engineering layer of like, how can we make features that are predictive and are, that serve our machine learning models and kind of branching a little bit more into that kind of ML, AI sort of space. Yeah. I think that would be another great way to kind of like, kind of future proof, future proof your job. Um, uh, other yeah, that's, th a, yeah. that's already a big thing. So Rust, yeah. Rust, yeah. internet, like mostly understanding how things operate to optimize, mm -hmm. you know, the different layers mm -hmm. of, uh, of codes, uh, yeah. streaming. And yeah, what an another last thing you would like to add? Oh yeah, I think well, one more is I mean just like just on like really indexing on like communication as well, right? Of like how yeah, soft to skills. Uh, soft skills, uh, like because that's the one that I think is like sure your SQL is gonna get you the job, but like the really the leadership and the soft skills and like how to like grow. That's how you grow, right? And that's how like and and eventually I think most people. They recognize that like they don't want to be a data engineer their whole career. Yeah. They want to like I don't know maybe be a manager or a leader or something, right? Oh, products, I mean, yeah. yeah so, or like building something or doing something different. They don't just want to write SQL for forty years, right? That's like <laughs> I mean, like like I I mean even like even for me I recognize I'm like as a content creator I'm like well I don't want to just do data engineering content for forty years either. Yeah. I know like that would be that was, that's going to be a lot, right? That's too much, right? So like. I know even for me, I'm trying to think about like how to uh, kind of shift and pivot there. But like, yeah, soft skills are super important. Like, yeah. especially like what we were talking about earlier, like writing and persuasion yeah. and like that kind of stuff, I think is is very powerful. SQL like, can get you the job yeah. and the soft skill can get the promotion. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's a great way to think about it. Sure. <laughs> Good. Um, Content wise, what's what's next for you? So you you started your your boot camp, your mm -hmm. data engineering boot camp. Yeah. And uh, what what's your plan around this and the other plans that now you're going yeah. solo? Yeah. So um, well, a couple things like so I did my first boot camp uh, like uh, a couple weeks ago. We did like a, a six week program where we talked. Uh, it was like two weeks of data modeling, a week of Flink, a week of Spark, a week of data quality, a week of data communication. And then a bonus week of LLM driven data engineering, like, yeah. which is like where we use like Chat GPT, Chat GPT to do like pipeline work for us, which is really, really fun. And, uh, and so that one was like, I did 50 people for that one. And uh, that bootcamp was really fun. I learned a lot. I learned that like, you know, the problem we were talking about earlier about data engineering splitting between like kind of the more analytics focused mm -hmm. data engineers that are really trying to focus on business problems. And then you have like the more technical kind of SWE DE data engineers. Um, that was the feedback I got from the bootcamp was like, they're like, because I, I focus more on like the, the, the SWE DE archetype for the bootcamp. And then a lot of people were like, like the Flink week, right? A lot of people were like, I got no value out of this, right? Because I yeah. was like, we had, a, we used a lot of Docker, a lot of like Kubernetes. It was like very, like very technical, very infrastructure oriented. And so the next bootcamp, I'm actually going to be splitting it. So there's going to be two tracks. There's going to be an analytics track and an infrastructure yeah. track. So like, and I'm hoping to take on a lot more students. So this next bootcamp, I'm hoping to take on 250 students. And so um, then I'm gonna be uh, releasing a course. Uh, so that first bootcamp that I already did, I did all the filming of it. It's like 40 hours of content. And I'm gonna be releasing that as a course as well. Uh, and that, that course is gonna be like about 300 bucks. And uh, that's gonna come out in like two or three weeks. That should cool. be awesome. And you're uh, doing a lot still yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, have you like getting people around uh, yeah. to help you? Oh I, yeah. I, I, like the 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 first time we chat in person, mm -hmm. it's, it's that you were looking for an editor. Yeah, an editor. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Yeah, for sure. Editor, for sure. That's like I, I have someone editing my course now. That's like what okay. they're doing, right? Yeah. I just got someone off of Fiverr. They're actually better than I. I you know I was very skeptical. I was like, is this Fiverr person gonna be good enough? And like that, that's great. And so uh, yeah, like. 
um, definitely that is, oh yeah, I would not do all the editing. That would be, all oh, that be, especially 40 <laughs> hours of content, dude. That's a lot of editing. That's like, I would, I would die, right? <laughs> yeah, I love, I love editing, but I understand it's... like people, it's not everybody's cup of tea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, cool, so that's, that looks really um, exciting um, for, for you and for, for your future. So mm -hmm. I would like just to take a moment to thank you again for all the free content because we've yep. been talking lately mm -hmm. just about your, your paid course mm -hmm. uh, because you get to make a living now that you're not working for a fan but i would yep. like to take a moment to thank you for all the free content you'll be putting yep. up there thank you and you're gonna continue that i <laughs> encourage you uh it was amazing it's inspired me to be there today mm -hmm. right because my uh data engineering content uh journey started with you, Ben, Seattle Data Guy, mm -hmm. uh, that was there. There was not a lot of people back then. Yep. Uh, so yeah, just thank you, and I wish you all the best for the future. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me on the show.